Uh, we're going to kick off our first science talk. I'm really happy to announce uh, to introduce um, Todd Henry, um, a good friend for a long time, uh, and he's going to tell us about 2,000 years of astronomy training. So, Todd. Thanks, Don. I'm assuming this microphone's working okay. Let's do a test. Everybody put your hands up. Wave back and forth. Nice, that's dynamics happening. That's astrometry because I'm seeing the changes of locations of your hands. Well done. And also I'd like to thank Don, Elise, Ellen, Chaz, and everybody for putting this together. <clears throat> We have a conference all about astrometry in the United States. Ah, finally, thank you. <clears throat> okay, so 2000 years of astrometry, it's gonna be rough. Um, it's gonna be fast and I'll try to cover some basics. The idea is for you to get some basics of astrometry down because how many people in this room can spell astrometry in less than three seconds? Probably not used to even saying the word, let alone spelling it. So this is new to a lot of people. We'll start putting the universe together with this thing called the sun. If you use astrometry, you can figure out how many stars of different kinds there are near the sun, because only using astrometry can you measure something called a parallax. And with a parallax, you can put together a volume limited, volume complete sample, and you can figure out what the universe is actually made of. And this is what our group, the Recons group has done for years. And this is the answer. Of all the stars out there, 74% of them are little M dwarfs. And we only knew that because we could do astrometry. So in our group, and I'm gonna put a lot of data up here that you've seen from our group as examples of what basic astrometry looks like. We're trying to figure out what the universe is made out of. And I know why you guys are here. Where are the planets? And there's the ultimate question that I think most of you are concerned with, and that is where is the life on those planets? And an interesting historical tidbit. When I became a baby astronomer and got my PhD a couple of years ago, not very long ago, um, you couldn't talk about life on other planets without people looking at you strangely. And now if you don't do that, people look at you strangely. So we've come a long way in just a couple of years since I got my PhD. <clears throat> So astrometry helps answer all of these because if you don't know the locations of the stars, you don't know the locations of the planets and you don't know where the life is. So you need astrometry for all of it. So let's see if we can do some astrometry. You need a map. And I'm happy to say this is a map that we put together. We being uh, the Recons group, oh, it's a little cut off at the bottom there. So all the references are gonna disappear in this talk off the bottom. <clears throat> That's all right. <clears throat> Are we better? Okay. Uh, National Geographic and I worked together to do this map because we had discovered this little star here, a red dwarf, that's the 20th nearest star to the sun and nothing has been found that's stellar nearer than that since 1997. But astrology is all about the old real estate mantra, location, location, location. And so that's what you're here to do this week is figure out the locations of dots in the sky and figure out if you can find unseen dots next to them. That's sort of the goal. <clears throat> and so there are a bunch of different motions astrometrically that you need to think about. The first one is position. That's simple. I think everybody knows that one. That's just where the dot is. But then you have to worry about the motions of the dot itself. And one of those is proper motion. That's just a slide across the sky. It's going to be a little more subtle. And um, there's a twist to proper motion that you may not have thought about before. Then there's parallax, and that makes an ellipse in the sky for the dot. And that's not because the dot itself is moving, it's because you're moving. You're on a planet that's going around the sun, and as you go around the sun, you get that reflex motion reflected in the sky, and that gives you an ellipse. And then there's the perturbation, that's the best part. And you guys are gonna be looking for wobbles on top of all these other things. Now we all have friends who do radial velocities, but there's a little secret. Radial velocities are easy. <laughs> Astrometry is hard, and that's why very few people try to do it. Only the strongest can do astrometry, and that's why you're here today. <clears throat> we appreciate you. Uh, here is 2,000 years of astrometry in one slide. Uh, I decided to get more pedagogical on this so you guys are ready for the week, uh, but I will touch on some historical things along the way. And this graph just shows you the precision in arc seconds of the measurement 
over time, and you can see we're going back 2000 years. So I think I've, I've met the standard of the title of the talk all in one graph. And you can see up there, there's this guy named Hipparchus. You might've heard of him a long time ago. And then you stretch down about 2000 years later and you see this thing called Hipparchos, which was, it's actually an acronym and it has Hipparchos in it. Um, it's an improvement slightly by a few orders of magnitude in the precision of things that were measured by Hipparchos the guy versus Hipparchos the spaceship that's out there. And for reference here, there's one arc second on this. And that is sort of a standard precision that you can reach from the ground to measure parallax, for example. Um, you can try a little harder and maybe get five or 10 times better than that, but the atmosphere is trouble and it always makes things really hard. And now we're in the realm of milli arc seconds. We never used to talk, sorry, um, arc seconds for positions, milli arc seconds for parallaxes from the ground. We can do one milli arc second parallaxes from the ground and maybe up to five or 10 times better if you try really, really hard. But getting beyond a milli, sec milli arc second from the ground is virtually impossible. <clears throat> unless you work really hard and have a giant maybe amount of observing time, I think observed for you know, 20 or 30 years to, to beat down the errors. There are a few high points along this graph. I'm not gonna go through all of them. You can Google just the names that are on here and see what happens. But after Aparcos, one of the big names you might recognize there is Tycho Brahe. We spent a lot of time making very accurate measurements and some people use those measurements. There was this guy, I think his name was Kepler, who used some of Brahe's measurements. Uh, to fill out, figure out some laws that we'll talk one about, one of which we'll talk about later today. Um, and then we have sort of in the red dots, just the positions of things and how things get better. And then in the blue circles, the key, which is the distance measured using the parallax on top of that. So you can see how the precision gets better. There are two dotted lines there. One is for the positions of things. One is for the parallaxes of things. And then there are numbers associated with these. And you can see the numbers growing over time until they get up into the millions. And Aparcus comes along and does 120,000 or so, but the precision got much better. And then Gaia has made the enormous leap. And Michael Perryman and others talk more about the Gaia statistics and what that really means. But you live in interesting times. You've lived for this and this. I don't think there's anybody younger than the Hipparchus epoch of 1990. Actually, I guess they're all the key point. Wow. It's happened. It's happened. <laughs> you were in the, in the crush in the, the hospital and Hipparchus had already been released. Wow. <clears throat> okay. Well, fine. I don't think anybody in here is younger than the release of Gaia DR1. <clears throat> So that's all in one slide. All right, position. How do we measure positions in the sky? Anybody? <laughs> Thank you, Chaz. I'm glad somebody's still awake. Uh, but the, what is the grid system we use? I and X. Thank you. We use alpha and, and delta for those. Sometimes you'll see those in papers, right? Right ascension declination. This is the easy part. I'm a little concerned now. <clears throat> All right, so I think everybody's seen the celestial sphere before, but just to remind you very quickly, you live on a little marble here in the middle. You have a North Pole and a South Pole and an equator. We just blow that out into the sky. We make a celestial equator, but then there's this funny red line called the ecliptic. Unfortunately, the Earth is not vertical relative to the rest of the solar system. It's tilted, so the ecliptic is tilted relative to that. So that's a different line in red. We measure right ascension in hours going around, hours, minutes, and seconds of time. You can also do it in degrees and fractional degrees. And then we have a declination going north to south. It goes from plus 90 at Polaris. Well, Polaris is really 89 point something or other. And down to the south uh, at minus 90. So I think everybody's got that part, right? I see lots of nodding heads. Good, we've all been there. Fair enough. Did you know there was this guy, the Herschels, the couple of Herschels, um, uh, husband and wife, they decided that they would just use positions to figure out what the galaxy looked like. So here's some historical perspective. They use these things called star gauges. You would call them fields on the chip of your giant CCD on some telescope these days. But they were just counting how many stars there were in many hundreds of fields in the sky and saying, I see this many stars over here and this many stars over here and this many here. And I'm going to try to build up a map. The problem is that they didn't have all the tricks that we have today. For example, they didn't have any parallaxes because the first parallax was not measured until 1838. And you can see from the date up there, this is roughly 50 years before that. So no parallaxes existed. 
they didn't have any colors for the stars. They were basically ogling them through a telescope and counting, and they didn't have an HR diagram. We love the HR diagram, right? <clears throat> you can't do much of anything in stellar astronomy without an HR diagram, the fundamental map. If you don't have one, how do you do this? Well, you just look at pictures in the sky. <clears throat> These are nice pictures taken using the Super Cosmos um, data set that had scanned all the thousands and thousands of glass plates that existed. Um, they were taken in the 1950s up through the 1990s in the entire survey of the sky. And you can look sort of toward the galactic North Pole and you can look toward the galactic center and assumptions, which are terrible assumptions today, but not so bad for 200 or so years ago. And they came up with a model of the galaxy that looks like this microbe that probably is crawling on your skin right now, right? So this is the shape of the galaxy that they came up with. And you think, well, it's pretty crude. Is it anywhere close to being correct? They got some things right, just using positions of stars in the sky and counting. They got the fact that the Milky Way is a disk. We weren't even sure that we lived in a galaxy or we lived in a universe that was all one galaxy and there were other galaxies. We didn't know that back then. They figured out that it's thinner in one direction than it is in another direction. So they got the basic shape of it right. They're off by sort of a factor of 10, but for that kind of precision or that kind of technology, that's pretty good. They put the sun near the center, which is wrong. And they got the Milky Way being a certain size, it was too small. But still, using astrometry positions alone, they figured out the shape and generally where the galaxy was in the universe, <clears throat> at least as far as that looks like in a shape. Another example, globular clusters, some of my favorite objects. These were studied by the Shapleys. I think everybody's seen a globular cluster before, right? About 100,000 stars, maybe a million stars for the bigger ones. And what they did is they just looked at the apparent sizes and the locations in the sky. And then sometimes they looked at the brightest star in those globular clusters. And they put that information together to derive a distance. Now derive is maybe a bit of a strong word. They estimated a distance, right? Using the fundamental attributes of how big it was and assuming they were all basically the same. <clears throat> and then they made a map and they found this map. And what you can see is that there's a cluster of globular clusters around some place over in the direction of Sagittarius. Huh, we're over here on the right-hand side at zero and minus 20,000 light years is roughly where they put us. But what they discovered simply again by using positions alone with some guessing about distances is that we're not in the center of the Milky Way. So it's another giant leap forward from the fact that the Milky Way was a disc shaped thing and now we're not in the middle. So this is effectively a Copernican revolution for the Milky Way instead of the solar system, right? Removing us from the center and saying, sorry, you humans, you're just not that special. Don't forget that you're not that special. Well, you are because you're doing astrometry this week. So you are special, fair enough. <clears throat> All right, another modern example of this. That doesn't look like a whole lot there, but that actually is a globular cluster called Palomar 5. It's one of the ones that was discovered more recently than some of the others, so it doesn't have the fancy name. Uh, and this is from commissioning data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And believe it or not, just by measuring positions here, that's all you have to do, and that's what Odin Kirchner et al. did, is map the dots there, and then do a contour plot of the location of those, and you get a very funny structure. You get the fact that you have a globular cluster in the middle, and then you've got these tails going off in two directions, simply again, astrometrically measuring the position of each of those stars. And they found that they stretch over two degrees on the sky. Now think about that for a second. How wide is the full moon on the sky? Half a degree, right? So let's put five full moons. That's basically your fist. This one globular cluster stretches about the size of your fist across the sky. And you can then derive with some more fancy math that there's mass loss going on. These are the ones that are going to be halo members in the future. Uh, and you can start to put an orbit of this globular cluster around the Milky Way because of the tidal tails that have been caused by this. 
And again, it's done astrometrically just using the positions. You don't need any distances for this. Just assume all those dots are up there in the sky in some location. All right, that was the easy one. Here comes proper motion. <clears throat> we use mu for that, mu is for motion. That's the symbol you wanna use. And I think everybody's seen this kind of graph before, this kind of schematic, right? Here's the sun, there's some exploding blue star out here, I guess. And it's moving across the sky with some velocity, and we measure that as a proper motion mu, which is measured typically in arc seconds per year, or now in the guy age, milli arc seconds per year are the numbers you're going to see in the tables you check. Remember, though, that it's distance dependent. The further away something is, the smaller its proper motion, even though it has the same transverse velocity. <clears throat> or sorry, it has the same intrinsic transverse velocity. The space velocity is that other vector up there, which combines the radial velocity that we're not talking about this week, plus <clears throat> the proper motion put together. You can get the space motion of the object. All right. Warning, equation number one. There will be equations during this talk. I made them easy, <laughs> and I give you little examples. So that is the most fundamental equation of proper motions that you're going to run into in astronomy. It's that 4.74 number. Always carry that around your pocket times the proper motion in arc seconds per year times the distance in parsecs. So we have to, we actually have to have a distance here to make this work. And the idea is to get the tangential velocity of an object in kilometers per second. That's where the 4.74 conversion factor comes in there. So let's do an example. If I give you all an object at one parsec that's moving at one arc second a year, how fast is it moving in the transverse direction? 4.74, don't make it hard. This is an easy class so far. <clears throat> All right, let's put it at 10 parsecs. It's still only moving one arc second a year. What's the answer? 47, all right, good. Now we're all waking up. Now let's put it at 100 parsecs. Things are getting interesting. How fast is it moving? Is it? The answer is yes, but are you going to find these objects? No. Why not? Faster than, that's fast, no. It's one-tenth of 1% 1 of the speed of light. <laughs> uh, nope, observationally, one arc second is really easy to find. Bingo. The escape velocity of the galaxy is four to 500 kilometers a second, so you're not likely to find those. If you do, I wanna talk to you this week. We have a secret name for those, we call them zingers that are leaving the galaxy, or they could be spitballs from Andromeda coming through our galaxy, right? So if you get a very large number over several hundred kilometers a second, pay attention. All right, the Gaia DR3 errors, and I'm, I'm gonna show this number again for parallax, it turns out to be roughly the same number, uh, 0.04 million arc seconds per year. That I have estimated based on the stars within 10 parsecs, which gives you a full range of brightnesses from very bright to very faint. And I just took the median value. So you're gonna see things that move, that have precisions better than that. You're gonna see things that have precisions worse than that. But that's a fair number to carry around in your pocket uh, for the week. <clears throat> so if you add a wave velocity in a parallax, you can then get the total space motion, as I mentioned, and these things called UVW that you might've heard of, right? Where U is, is the direction uh, towards the center, V is around the galaxy, and W is up out of the galaxy. And those are very useful for putting together things like clusters, because all the stars in a cluster are probably moving together. You may end up doing some of that this week. Here's just one example from Ilya Madan, who's a graduate student in our, our department. Uh, he's plotted the metallicity here versus the tangential velocity, and it shows you very clearly that stars that have lower metallicities are generally have higher tangential velocities. And that is a direct clue as to how the galaxy was formed and the fact that older stars tend to move faster and also tend to be in the halo of the galaxy. But this distribution shows you also that you mix things up, right? If I have something with a metallicity of minus 0.5, it could be at any tangential velocity. The galaxy is a messy place. So always keep that in mind. There's a lot of stuff moving out there in various ways, and that's why astrometry is fun. 
All right, the SMARTS telescopes I'm going to mention here uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that a lot of the data you're going to see is coming from these telescopes. I happen to be the director of SMARTS, and these are four small telescopes in Chile, three of them here in the old two-mass telescope down over the hill. And we've had an astrometry program going there <coughs> since 1999. How many people in the room have been born after 1999? Wow. We have one of the students in our group who likes to show some of his plots and say, I was this big, and he shows a picture when he was four years old <clears throat> when these data started being taken. Um, this was a three-year surveys program with the National Laboratory, now called NOAA Lab. It was NOAO. Three years. It was a three-year project. It's still going. So be careful what you choose to propose to do. Sometimes it will haunt you for the rest of your life. Uh, it's been really fun. Uh, and you can actually still, I believe this is the last telescope, the 0.9 meter, in the southern hemisphere that you folks in the room can touch because everything else in the Southern Hemisphere you either do remotely or you travel there and then somebody else is typing in things for you. You get to run it all there. So if anybody has any interest in working on telescopes and touching telescopes, I can set you up and you will have guaranteed friends at the telescope. <laughs> Rest assured, no doubt. <clears throat> all right, so we've got a lot of data coming from there. Actually, we do that radio velocity stuff at the 1.5 meter right next door as well, but we can do that. So this is just a picture of Proxima Centauri, well, it's several pictures taken over 10 years, of the proper motion of a star, an actual movie of stars moving in the sky, not just, oh, we measured this and then we have this nice computerized thing and we move the little dots around. This is the actual data. Can anybody tell me why the stars are flickering in the background? Atmosphere. The atmosphere causes something called seeing. Right, And this is what you're battling against to do astrology from the ground all the time. The atmosphere, you're basically at the bottom of a pool and you're looking up at your friend's face and it's all messed up because of all the bubbles in the atmosphere. And that's what's happening. And it changes the sizes of the PSF. That we could talk about ad nauseum, but we won't today. We could do it at lunch uh, and how you have to deal with that when you do astrology from the ground. <clears throat> so astrology from the ground, as I mentioned, had been done with a supercosmos plates, that's one data set. You can also download this stuff from the Hubble, uh, from uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. All the plates are there. These are really useful bits of information because they go back 50 years. And <clears throat> just to, to do a little poke at the Gaia folks, I have to do it. Uh, supercosmos has 1.9 billion sources as opposed to Gaia's 1.8 billion sources. Um, so basically anything in Gaia is also on these plates in the Supercosmos archive. And Nigel Hamley is a buddy of mine. We work together on this and he's deep in the Gaia uh, as well. So it's, everybody's playing the same game here. But astrometrically, this is a very rich data set <clears throat> and it exists and probably most of you never even heard about it. But you can go online and you can pull down Supercosmos information. This is particularly good, not for planets, but for example, if you had a star, it's like, oh, I think that proper motion is right. You could go back and look at these and get 50 years ago to see if that's really where the dot was. So that's useful. So let's play a game here. We're going to measure some proper motions by eye. These are three supercosmos images of three of these stars we call the supercosmos recon survey, SCR stars. And I'm going to blink them the way it used to be done many, many years ago with a blink comparator where you looked in two things and had a plate on each one and you could see things move. So let's do the one on the left. If noon is directly straight up, 12 o'clock, and six o'clock is down and three is to the right, like a clock, at what direction is that one moving? Three o'clock, good. If you weren't sure, I know online you can't see it, but there it is. <laughs> that's the one, all right, that's the easy one. You've got the hang of it now. <clears throat> One in the middle, six o'clock, right, up and down. Fine, you guys are good at this, this is easy. Good luck, the one on the right. Eleven, no. Eight, no. No, nice try. Nine? Uh, I'll buy nine because we're starting with the blob in the middle. That's obvious. I threw you a curveball here. <clears throat> the actual dot is that one. So it's really moving at three o'clock, but I'll give you nine. Why? What happened there? Um, 
there are some plate defects. There could sometimes be dust on the image that is scanned, or I didn't tell you the twist that one of those is a blue image and one of those is a red image. And this is a very red object, so the brightness changes. So keep in mind that stars have colors. Herschel's didn't have that information, but you do, because Gaia gives you a bunch of colors as well as super cosmos. So these are just some examples. These are three very interesting objects, it turns out. Um, this was a single M dwarf at just eight parsecs. That one was at four parsecs, and that one has a brown dwarf going around it. Uh, you can see orbits of that um, on our website if you want to see it. And this was a, an M dwarf, we think white dwarf pair, but it's a very weird white dwarf. And there's some slim chance still that it's a neutron star, which would make it super sexy. And we're hoping that turns out to be the case, but we need more data. You'll see that orbit in a minute. All right, so proper motions. You can do things from the ground using proper motions, but you have to fight the atmosphere. Or you can go in space and you can use 126 HST orbits and stare at this globular cluster. Why in the world would you wanna do that? Because then you can use a proper motion diagram where you plot uh, declination in one axis, that's the vertical one, and right ascension in the other axis, and you can actually get a separation of the objects in that globular cluster with a very tiny proper motion relative to the background stars. Not every dot in here is actually a member of the globular cluster. It looks like they are, but they're not. And so you can tease those out and you say, okay, well, why would you spend 126 HST orbits on this? Look at the magnitude limits, 30. If you've ever measured anything at magnitude 30, you are one of the five people on the planet who's probably done that, right? So it takes a lot of orbits. Why would you wanna do that? Because when you have this proper motion information, you can tease apart all the way down to the M dwarfs in a globular cluster. It can be done if you go to 30th magnitude. Parallax, okay, now things are getting interesting. <clears throat> we use pi for parallax. Now I'm gonna cause hopefully not an international incident here. The reason we use pi for parallax is historically that's what's been done. It's a little confusing because it's also 3.14159 and all the other digits, right? But pi is the one that's been used. Now, Gaia has chosen to use this thing. Some of us are not fans. <laughs> I will leave that for lunch. All right, so you see one of those symbols, it's parallax. So you have an astronomer, you guys are all astronomers, right? And you have telescopes in your head, believe it or not you're gonna measure a distance to that star. How are you going to do that? Well, you can actually use the two telescopes in your head. Yes, those are pictures of my retina because my partner is an optometrist and I'm hooked up. <clears throat> and you can use those telescopes and you can look at that star and you can measure the distance to it. The problem was that the stars are really far away and we couldn't measure that distance with our eyes, right? We needed telescopes that were bigger and more precise and do things like wait for the earth to move around the sun and take stereoscopic pictures. But at one arc second, you have, um, sorry, at a distance of one parsec, you would get a parallax of one arc second, right? That's the definition of a parsec, by the way. A parallax of one arc second is the distance to an object that would give you that reflex motion because of the Earth's orbit. So everybody, you're gonna measure your first parallax, unless you've seen me do this demonstration before. Dawn's already starting. She's like, I remember how to do this. All right, so put your thumb out in front of your face, put it on the ruler there, close one eye, look at it, close the other eye, look at it. Does your thumb move? How much? Turn that into angular measurement and you've measured your first parallax. If it didn't move, go see your friendly neighborhood optometrist. <laughs> okay? And for those of you in the front, you're closer, so your parallax is larger that you measured than the people in the back right? Because of the scale. <clears throat> Good enough. <clears throat> if you move your thumb in really close, you get a much larger parallax. That's the other way it works. So go ahead and do that if you want. Bigger jump, right? Again, if it didn't jump, go talk to somebody about that. So what do we do here? We don't use our thumbs. We don't use our eyes. We use telescopes. We look at stars out in space. We look at from one position in the Earth's orbit. We measure where that star is relative to the background stars. And we take the other one six months later. And in fact, just so you know, it's actually two times the parallax because the definition of parallax is a one astronomical unit baseline, but the Earth is actually two AU roughly. And of course it's not exactly two AU, depends on what time of year it is. And you got to collect for all that stuff. We're not gonna go into those details. 
the Gaia folks have taken care of that for you. <clears throat> Lucky you. All right, equation number two. This is the easy one. The distance is one over the parallax in arc seconds. Distance is in parsecs. So if I have one arc second, what's the distance? One parsec. Fair enough. Tenth of an arc second? Ten parsecs. Hundredth of an arc second. Thank you. Now things get really interesting. Now we're down at one milli arc second, one mass. You're at a thousand parsecs. If you're going to go past that, you're probably up to no good. You're starting to think about galactic structure, and that's not why you're here this week, right? So remember the guy, the uh, three arrows are about that. So you'd get a signal to noise at a thousand parsecs of about 25 in general. Um, you can do statistical games past a thousand parsecs for sure. You can find things like Gaia Enceladus, the giant galaxy that bashed into the Milky Way and made the thick disk, we think. You can do that kind of things. You have lots and lots and lots of dots and play the statistical game. But an individual dot, you got to be a little, little careful. I would suggest for this week, oops. No, oh, it's coming here. Um, this is part of the distance ladder, right? You've seen this probably in introductory textbooks before. And here we are with stellar parallax down here. And we used to draw a line at about 200 parsecs. You didn't dare go past 200 parsecs. But Gaia has now taken us to at least 1,000 parsecs, maybe a little bit further, depending on what you want to do. But for this week, I have a very clear recommendation for you. Don't even bother going past 100 parsecs. Right? There's not going to be any need. There are plenty of planets. And honestly, if you can't find friends among the nearest 3 million star systems, then there's something wrong with you. <clears throat> that should be plenty. So 10 million arc seconds should be your limit. <clears throat> what can you use parallaxes for? Ever heard of these guys before? Of course you have. Hertzsprung published a whole bunch of papers in the 1910s listing um, attributes of various stars and colors and that kind of stuff and maybe estimated distances. And then Russell came along and actually plotted it on a graph. And when he did that, you got this thing. You saw a series of stars in temperature down here. It's not shown actually in this particular figure in absolute magnitude there, which violates um, Todd's rule of presentation because you can't read the numbers but you get schematically what's going on here. There's a sequence of stars and we now call that the main sequence. And this is an HR diagram that you cannot do with parallaxes. So parallaxes are very important and a really good thing to do. <clears throat> so how do you do this? Well, <clears throat> from the ground, you would choose a star like this, Proxima Centauri. And then you would take a lot of pictures of it over one year, mm, two years, better, three years. Okay, got it. And you measure the parallax relative to a whole bunch of reference stars in the background. Now there's a twist. Remember that every single one of those stars also has a parallax. It's just tiny compared to the one for Proxima for nearby stars. Proxima's will turn out to be 700 plus million arc seconds. And the parallaxes of each one of these will probably be between one and two million arc seconds. So you have to subtract that out. So what you first measure for Proxima is called the relative parallax. And then you have to correct it because the whole background is moving as well with tiny ellipses compared to the big ellipse of Proxima uh, to make it an absolute parallax. And those are just some of the terms I could throw at you right now, but without making this a full course, I'm not gonna go into all these things. Again, that's a lunchtime discussion if you really want the details of all those. There are um, about 50 more terms. I should also point out that Elliot Vimut is in the room. Elliot, can you raise your hand? Elliot is our black belt astrometrist now in the group, and some of the results you're going to see coming up are from Elliot. Um, so he can explain these as well or better than I can at this point. <clears throat> okay, so you can measure a trigonometric parallax from the ground to better than a million arc second. In some cases, if you work really hard, you have a nice reference field because the reference field matters and what kinds of stars you have in the reference field, all of that. <clears throat> We did that uh, in Anikon's group and we published this thing in 2018. This is just an update of the HR diagram for the solar neighborhood. And you can see all the little red blobs are red dwarfs that we discovered within 10 parsecs of the sun and a couple of white dwarfs that nobody had appreciated were near that close to the sun as well. So you can build robust HR diagrams and I suspect all of you will be doing that this week. Uh, in all the courses I teach and many of our group meetings, I say, well, where's the HR diagram for that? And show me your stars on the HR diagram. So I think one of the early things you should think about doing is getting some sample out of Gaia and make an HR diagram. And you can use Gaia colors. I think it would be a really good exercise. <clears throat> so what happened over these years, 
Well, there was this amazing bit of work called the Gale Parallax Catalog that was published in 95. That was the fourth version of the YPC. And it included all the ground-based parallaxes ever measured, putting them together into a compendium that had 8,000 systems in it. Wow. So that's why Hipparchus was such a giant leap. But people worked really hard to do this, and they found almost 200 star systems within 10 parsecs of the sun. Hipparchus came along, it added about 18. The little one there was that one I showed you on the National Geographic map that we actually published the same year as Hipparchus. Hipparchus didn't get that because Hipparchus had a magnitude limit, it was too faint. The red dwarfs were not showing up in Hipparchus very much. Guy has fixed all that. Then for several years, Hipparchus happened, nobody needed to do anything, but we started our program on that little telescope, that 0.9 meter in Chile right here, and we started publishing things. Again, every time you see a red number was a system we added. And folks started adding other things, one or two, here and there along the way. Most of these were brown dwarf additions because we collected most of the red dwarfs at that point that had been missed. And the southern sky was really good to do that because most of the observations and telescopes were in the north, right? So the south is why we went down there to pull those in. And then we published one big paper uh, in 2018, which was a full sweep of everything we had uh, at the time. And we said, okay, that's it. I think we're pretty much done publishing parallaxes because there's this thing, Gaia that went up. And so Gaia also pushed through the 10 parsec sample and they found one new thing. <laughs> I was like, ah, we did it right. So Gaia did not add a lot to the 10 parsec sample because people worked on that really hard because of course nearer is better. And the exoplanets you guys are gonna wanna look for are gonna be around the things within 10 parsecs first, maybe 25 parsecs. If you wanna stretch to 100 parsecs, you can try that, but you're probably not gonna see signals of any planets that far out. So. Imagine you're now in the state of California and you have 39 million people. There are other people here, they're just not counted. You'd have another 26 million people who were hanging around that you didn't know about that had to be collected over that 20, 25 year span. So parallax work was hard, doing them one at a time. And you guys get to be born and exist at the moment when we just hand you the answer. Thank you, Michael Perryman, et al. Thank you, great Gaia. We love you for making our lives so much easier. <clears throat> all right, so Gaia. I'm not gonna talk a lot about Gaia because other people are gonna do that. Um, <clears throat> but I do wanna point out a couple things, you know, 1.8 billion sources, that's a huge data set. Not all of those are gonna have useful parallaxes. Let me say that again. Not all of those are gonna have useful parallaxes. A lot of those are not gonna be very useful because they're too far away. Nonetheless, there are data in there for them. You gotta be pretty savvy about which ones you pick to do your science. Here is uh, a set of HR diagrams by Gaia from the 2018 article. This was from DR2. And this shows 25 parsecs, 50 and 100. And you can see things changing. And it's a beautiful HR diagram with all kinds of structure, much of which we'd never seen before because we only had the 8,000 dots from the YPC or 100, 120,000 dots from Parcos. But Parcos didn't go faint enough to get all the really cool stuff at the bottom of the graph. So my question for you is, there are extra populations showing up as you move out to 100 parsecs. Name them. What do you see in the 100 parsec version that you don't see in the 25 parsec version? Red giants, good. What else? White dwarfs, you get a lot more white dwarfs. Anything specific about the white dwarfs? You get a, a bifurcated sequence, do you know why? <clears throat> we'll let the Gaia folks handle that. Yes, <clears throat> this crystallization. There's also some widening going on because of uh, composition in the atmosphere as the hydrogen and helium comes into play. <clears throat> you also see up at the top there, we have the red giants, but there's a clump. It's called the red clump. Those are horizontal branch stars, right? You see this little tail down here. What's that? Well, they are main sequence stars, what kind? Uh, actually, the pre-main sequence are close. Pre-main sequence are mostly these up here. I'm looking at this particular tail there. Binary. Binaries, those are the binaries, right? Binary M dwarfs. So you get all these things. You also have cool sub dwarfs that really pop up. There aren't very many of those here. You get lots of cool sub dwarfs. These are the old ones that have low metallicities and it sort of forces them bluer on the HR diagram. <clears throat> and you get binary white dwarfs as well because you can see an elevated double sequence here, there, there's this blob and then there's a mimic of it with binary white dwarfs. So all kinds of things show up in 100 parsecs. 
Paradoxes have been done to the precision of Gaia before from the ground, but they're special. These are radio parallaxes. Radio parallaxes are done using radio interferometry, long baseline kinds of stuff. So you get very, very, very precise measurements of the individual dots. Then you wait six months and you get that dot again. So you can see that tiny, tiny little shift because your precision on the actual measurement is exquisite. <clears throat> um, and Reed et al. did that in a couple big papers and they mapped out these masers, which are in star formation regions, um, basically mazing at, at uh, water molecules <clears throat> primarily. And what they found was that you could measure from the position of the, the sun here, the earth here, where the spiral arms are because the star formation regions are in the spiral arms and you can make accurate measurements to a few kiloparsecs. And they actually got precisions that are comparable and even in some cases better than Gaia's to, the, to objects in amazing and star formation regions. So just to point out that you probably never thought about it before, there were exquisite parallax measurements made from the ground, but at radio wavelengths using interferometry. <clears throat> but notice we've only mapped tiny little pieces of the arms of the galaxy. And I teach a whole course on galactic structure. And one of the fun things we do is how many arms does the Milky Way have? And we put up on the wall um, pictures of other galaxies and students try to trace all the arms out in other galaxies, which are easy because we're not buried inside them. Even that is difficult. So figure out where the, where the arms are is a, is a tough, tough thing to do. All right, one of these you're gonna do probably this week is build a sample. <clears throat> and when you build a sample, um, be careful of biases against it. This was a sample of K-dwarfs that we're looking at within 50 parsecs using the original Parkos data. You can see these are eight different equal volume shells. The numbers look funny because volume, of course, thinner shells as you get out because you have more volume uh, in those shells. Uh, but Aparcos gave us that many stars, DR1 gave us that many, and then DR2 gave us that many. We're going to go back. Uh, we have two new graduate students showing up. We're going to work on this and refine it using DR3. It's not going to change much from DR2 because the astrology doesn't really change all that much. Um, and so the point here is that you can put together thousands and thousands of stars. The 2,500 shown here are what we call the equatorial sample, as opposed to the 5,000 that are the all sky sample that we use. Um, but you're going to have biases in your samples. But if you stay within 100 parsecs, they're not going to be bad. All right, the best one, perturbations. We typically use A for the semi-major axis of an orbit or alpha for a photocentric orbit, as opposed to a, a relative visual orbit. So these are the things you're typically going to see. And at a given epoch, you often see the symbol rho. That's just the separation at a given epoch. <clears throat> but A is a semi-major axis. I think everybody knows that. And alpha is the one we use uh, for a photocentric orbit. All right, equation number three. I think you know this one. P squared is A cubed, right? Let's, let's modify Kepler. Let's make it Newtonian. Let's put both masses in there. And of course, remember the fact that in Newtons, you have to have solar masses there, right? That's the trick. Now, for you guys, this is, I think, really important for this week. If you take the sun and Jupiter and you let it orbit, you can observe it going around once every 12 years. That means it has a same major axis of about 5 AU. The important thing is that for everything you do this week, talking about exoplanets on nearby stars, the numbers don't change radically because M1 plus M2 for any kind of star that's regular, you know, you're not going to use O stars for this, but any kind of M or K star or G star, they're all roughly one solar mass. So you're always going to end up, even if you take two red dwarfs at three tenths of solar mass each and throw it in there 10 years, it's a couple AU. If I take a red dwarf and a planet, right, M2 becomes effectively zero. I run the numbers, I still get a couple AU. It's always going to be a couple AU for the kind of stuff you're thinking about in Gaia. And that's good, even though Gaia is not at 10 years yet, it's going to get there, fingers crossed. It's uh, 2014, first data. We're gonna get a couple more years and we get it, right? So the data aren't out yet, but it's coming. So P and A are comparable for all normal stars and solar system scales. So it's always gonna be a couple AU, for the kind of stuff you're interested in. Dirty secret number one, you only get the sum of the masses, <laughs> right? Don't forget that. Dirty secret number two, and this is what the radio velocity people do all the time. You only get the minimum mass. <clears throat> Right, if you're using radio velocities. <clears throat> um, so you have to be careful with that. And you have to assume a stellar mass. You don't know the mass of the star if you have a planet going around it because you don't know the mass of the planet. And if you don't know the masses, you have to guess. 
So what do you do? You take a mass to velocity relation like this one from Benedict et al. from 2016. This is an optical one, and the mass errors here are about 2%. You can never do better than 2% in your planet mass if your star mass isn't known to better than 2%. And a lot of times your star mass isn't known that well, right? So one of the little things that always niggling things that gets me is I see these exoplanet papers published with these infinitesimal errors on all the measurements. I'm like, no, that's all lying. You just can't do it. All right, orbits, you gotta see about orbits. You know P and A, I think everybody knows those, right? How many orbital elements are there in the fundamental orbit? Seven. Really nine. We're only going to talk about seven today, <clears throat> but seven. You have the eccentricity. That's the shape of the orbit. You have the inclination. That's its tilt, right? And just for everybody in the room, this is a big zero of a face on orbit, and the inclination is zero. So just think of that in the sky. It's telling you my inclination is zero. Then we have the epic of periastron. You have to know when things are happening in the orbit. And then there are the two that no one knows. Right? We have the longitude ascending node, which is a big omega, and we have the argument of periosteum, which is the little omega. This orients the orbit in space. We can talk more about that again at lunch, but let me give you a couple quick tricks, or one quick trick to try to remember this. Longitude the ascending node is the one that sets the orbit in this direction. What does this make you think of? The queen. There she is wearing her crown. The big omega is the queen waving at you. That's the orientation in this direction. Right? <clears throat> Little omega is the argument. That's the one that twists it around the sky. Okay? <clears throat> Maybe that should be her, um, her dogs wiggling. I don't know, with the little omega shape. So those two are always confusing. Um, believe it or not, astrometry has led to a Nobel Prize because uh, Genzodal and Gezodal measured the orbits of the stars going around the galactic center. And they published that orbit there using astrometry and AO imaging techniques in the infrared. And they found that the mass of the black hole in the center of the galaxy is about four times 10 to the six or 4 million times the mass of the sun, even though you can't see it. That's not the way most orbits work. In this case, they're looking at objects going on something they can't see. Usually you're looking at the thing you can see watching it wobble and trying to find the thing you can't see. So this is the opposite of that. So we don't have a Nobel prize yet for that. Somebody in this room should get one. So this is what a typical two-body system looks like, right? You see two objects going around, they're orbiting the center of mass, not each other, right? They're really orbiting the center of mass, that point in the middle. But you typically don't see the secondary. <clears throat> Instead, you just see the wobble. And we typically measure it in two different axes, right ascension and declination. That's really good in astrometry because rate of velocity, you only get one directional measurement. You get a period out of it, you don't know if that's right. In this, you better get the same period on both axes. You can make two independent measurements. It's like pure science. <clears throat> all right, everybody stand up. This is the best part. You're all going to learn why astrometry is the best. I expect you to teach this to your friends. I know Don has done this. I know Jackie has done this. Eric, I think you might have done this at some point. You've never done the exoplanet dance? Ah, this is good stuff. All right. <clears throat> your head is a star. Your fist is a planet. You can use either fist. I don't care. Put the planet out in front of your star. First, we will do microlensing for four different techniques of finding a planet indirectly. We're not taking pictures of it. So in microlensing, what happens? The planet slowly passes in front of your star. It's not in orbit. It's just some object hanging, and, and your eyes light up, right? Gets a little brighter, and that's it. It's done. It's gone. Never again. Do you believe it? All right. Let's put the planet in orbit around, and let's make it transit. Same idea, but now it's actually passing in front of the surface of the star. What's going to happen to you? First, your one eye closes, and then your other eye closes. And then the planet goes around, and it comes back, and one eye closes, and another eye closes. Nice to meet you. All right? It's winking. That's all transiting does. Still not very exciting. All right, fine. Let's go to radio velocities. We'll talk about them. Put the planet out there. Center of mass. Now, as the planet goes around, your head has to move, right? Like this, everybody do it. You can make the planet go away because you can't see it. No, no, don't move the body, just the head, just the head. But really, the radio velocity doesn't work that way. It's only one dimension, so it's really this. So do this. <laughs> Everybody's funky chicken, 
Good. Okay. Now the best astrometry, by far and away the best. Now, because now you're measuring the position of that star. So remember, your star, even before the planet moves, has a proper motion. All right? So you've got to move. Now, I'm not going to slam you all against the wall. <laughs> so what? we're going to mimic proper motion just by wobbling. So you're, you're moving this way. But now on the sky, you have an ellipse from the parallax. So do this. Right? So all stars are doing this. Much more exciting than all that other stuff. Right? So now you're doing this. Now add the planet. What happens? You got to perturb it. Yeah. This is a much more interesting dance than all the other ones. Thank you all. Feel free to use it at the club. It's a great pickup line. Want to see the exoplanet dance? <laughs> I'll, move you, I'll move your world. All right. So I took this uh, schematic from Michael's paper in 2012. Uh, it just shows the position of a star in right ascension declination over time, where the proper motion is the dotted line, then you add in the parallax, you get this loopy thing, and then you add a planet on top of that, and you get the exoplanet dance. You get the perturbation on top of that. This is a very complicated piece of math to solve, right? You've got to solve for the proper motion. You've got to solve for the parallax, and then you've got to solve for the perturbation itself. So it's tough. That's why only the strong try it. We've tried it. <laughs> and Elliot... Another shout out to him for, for doing a lot of the updating of some of these slides you're about to see. This is, these are data from the 0.9 meter telescope. We've already removed the parallax and the proper motion. So what's left is a flat line if there's no companion. And so uh, on the top there, you see a flat line in right ascension. On the bottom, you see a flat line in declination. There's no planet or other object more massive than a planet pulling on it. Down to a level something like this, this is a Jupiter in a 12 year orbit, just like in our solar system would cause a perturbation on each axis roughly if it's uh, inclination zero in the sky, about 7 million arc seconds, and we don't see that. But we didn't stop. We keep going, and we see this. Ah. Looks like we got a planet. Nope. <clears throat> I was going to see this last night. Anybody seen it yet? Yeah. I think we should have a field trip for the whole group because it's about aliens. Uh, that's not... Uh, actually a perturbation of a planet. That is something called secular acceleration. This is tough. So what's happening is you have a proper motion of a star and the sun here, but both are moving. So the distance is actually changing a little bit between them. And you don't see that usually until you get either very precise data, i.e. Gaia, or you look at it for a long time. Notice up here, we've been looking at this for 20 years. And so this proper motion is large for this object and the proper motion is actually changing over time. And so you have to be careful with that if you look at things for a long period of time. Well, long period of time. Here's a bunch of orbits just so you get exposure to some kinds of orbits. This is, again, uh, sort of 16 years of data. And this is a close binary M dwarf pair. Uh, we've done this very, very well. The cool thing here is that it's wrapped six times. So we've nailed the orbit. It looks a bit like a hodgepodge on the right, but it's actually not because you have the time element. When you make a plot like that, you don't have time. That's why it's good to split it out this way. You can see all the ups and downs that overlap over there. And even though the individual points may be 5 million arc second precision, you can build up an orbit that is much better than that because you have uh, the repetitive time effect going on. Uh, just so you know, I will be graying in here things that uh, were data that were taken before Gaia launched. And then it'll be green for the epic data of Gaia that now exists for 34 months in DR3 that you may have access to this week. So um, Gaia, for example, you could get this orbit right out of Gaia. And it'll be better than the one we have if we did only that. What I'm looking forward to is comparing our six orbit wraps to one Gaia orbit wrap <clears throat> to see how we do. I think we're probably not going to do quite as well because our precision is about 20 to 50 times worse per epoch, but we do have all those years and our proper motion is really well determined. All right, this is the same system taken with the HST fine guidance sensors <clears throat> by Fritz Benedict and I. And this is cool because if you look back at the shape of this orbit, see the shape? And you flip it in an axis, simply because of the way it's plotted, you see the same shape again. The key is that this is a photocentric orbit. We're measuring the position of one dot moving. It's the combined light of the two objects. 
In this one, we've split out those objects using HST's fine guidance sensors with really good resolution. It can down like 10 milli arc seconds, separate them out, measure them each to one milli arc second. You get the relative orbit uh, of both of them around the center of mass, which is the, where the crosshairs are there. And so you can get the mass ratio by the sizes of the two ellipses. In your case this week, you're gonna have a tiny, tiny little ellipse here for the star and a giant bigger ellipse um, for the companion that you can't see. <laughs> So you won't get that. You'll be back here in the photocentric case. <clears throat> Just another orbit. This one we've wrapped three times. You can see as the orbits get longer, um, we, three times instead of six times in the same amount of observational sequence, uh, the orbits get larger and the errors look smaller. The errors are still about the same at five million arc seconds per epoch. But again, wrapping the orbit is good. So if you wanna look for planets this week, and you have 34 months of data, ideally you'd have 12 months periods and you'd wrap it a couple of times to make sure you got it. Again, you know, we have data from before Gaia and that helps us out. Now we're getting to only one and a half orbits. The periods are getting longer. Now we're up at eight years. You won't be able to do this with the data you have from Gaia, um, but even a half extra orbit is plenty. We've wrapped it all the way around in another 50%. And you can see, um, so Guy would have a chunk of an orbit. You gotta be a little careful there. And Tim Brandt, I don't know if Tim's in the room, but he's gonna talk about some of the sophisticated ways you can play with MCMC modeling and all that. These are MCMC fits by the way, and Gaussian processes and all that to try to get um, orbits out even when you don't have enough data. Here is a sequence of orbits um, or a sequence of data sets from Ra 614, otherwise known as TJ234, a very famous object. Over years, at four years, you don't see much. At eight years, you start to see, ah, there's something happening. At 12 years, whoa, maybe that's it. At 16 years, oh, now I've finally wrapped it. So the lesson here is in order to get that beautiful orbit that you want, <clears throat> patience is critical. Astrometry is not for the people who are in a rush. Then you get to cases like this where you don't have a full orbit. Now you start to see the problems at half an orbit you can see that the best fit we have does not go through all the points. Things are not very well controlled, probably because the orbital period is wrong in that particular set. We don't know where it's headed. Gaia will not help you. It's only got a tiny little piece of the arc, so incomplete orbits beware. Finally, uh, this is that weirdo one I talked about that might be a neutron star, maybe kind of, sort of, but we don't have the full orbit yet, but we do have 16 years of data and it's still not there. So again, um, long-term programs yield the gold. This is the part that Gaia has. Gaia will never really touch this one because it's much longer than a 10-year orbit. It's gonna give us a nice piece. And I look forward to the day where we try to combine Gaia data with the, the long-term data that we have. And we're gonna keep on going. My goal is to keep this going for at least 30 years at this telescope. If anybody wants to play, come talk to me. Then there are catastrophically uh, nasty orbits that make you suffer. You see a perturbation only in one axis. What is going on? It's because it's oriented in the sky to fool you, right? <clears throat> That's a problem. Don't count on clear perturbations on both axes. Then you've got this one. What's this orbit gonna look like? It's hard. I know it's hard. It's almost edge on. Anytime you get a normal solution where the inclination is 90, you should be worried. Probably not right. This one is right. They do happen. <laughs> it's almost eclipsing. <clears throat> and it's a nearby red dwarf binding. So there are all kinds of orbits. This is our smallest orbit that I would say is reliable. It's at 19 million arc seconds for the orbit itself. For a mass of Jupiter, this is a small star as a companion. For uh, a Jupiter mass, you have to divide that by about 50. You know, you might uh, get to that's wrong. Um, divide by about 10. <clears throat> you get to a few million arc seconds uh, for some of the nearest stars, but it all depends on distance, right? Because distance matters for astrometry. Finally, we did an, uh, an exoplanet search. <clears throat> and here's the period in years using some of our data. These are the, the time periods that Gaia would cover in DR3. The longer periods allow us of coverage allow us to get down to half a Jupiter mass around Proxima Centauri. There is no Jupiter orbiting Proxima, Proxima Centauri not in an orbital period of a decade or anywhere close to a decade. So it's not there. Elliot, I'm gonna give a shout out. I'm just gonna move on to the final slide here. Um, this is Elliot's thesis work. 
And what he's doing is mapping all these red dwarf orbits and looking at the orbital period versus the eccentricity, which tells you the size and the shape of the orbit. And when he does that, you see some funny stuff happening. This is the wedge where you do not have anything past a few years orbital period that's in a circular orbit. That tells you a lot about how stars form. They just don't happen. The name of that is the Riemann wedge, just so you know. <laughs> All right, finally, to wrap it up, we have positions, we have proper motions, we have parallaxes, and we have perturbations. Those are the four different things you have to deal with. Positions easy, but you're going to be selecting for proper motions, parallaxes, and perturbations all week. So, hopefully, I've convinced you that astrometry is good for answering some of these fundamental questions. And I, the key point is if you're going to go explore the universe, make sure you take a map. But more importantly than a map, make sure you take along a lot of really good people who are friends of yours, who can help you along the way. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll get my question time on purpose. Okay, that was fabulous. Um, it is 10 o'clock. So, uh, all right, I know we had one, um, or we have a couple of online questions. So I'm gonna ask okay. one of them. Um, for those of you in the room, find Todd during the coffee break, which will start in like a minute or two. Okay, so uh, Gaia 03 comes with something called zero point corrections to the parallaxes as studied in uh, Lindgren et al. 2020. Could you please give an overview of how does this impact? <laughs> I'm going to defer to Michael. Okay, all right. So that'll be answered in the next talk. Because he'll answer, give a better answer than I will. Okay. Ah, because you get two independent measurements of something that's happening. So it's, it's, I like to call it pure science because you do, you do an experiment and you get an answer. And then you really want to go check it again. And astrometry offers you the opportunity to do that check immediately because you have two different measurements of the same thing. Again, the orbital period should be the same in both. If you don't see it in both, be very, very suspicious. But you could get one of those confounding examples I showed you of a perturbation only one direction or something uh, maybe that's too small in one direction versus the other. All right, thank you. Uh, let's, let's thank Todd again.